Could you welcome to the stage Sarah McRae, please? Whew, hello. <laughs> Hope you're all okay. Um, my name's Sarah McRae. I'm here to talk to you about atrial fibrillation today, which I know is not the most exciting topic for the last on, uh, an, on a conference, but I'm going to try and make it interesting and I'm going to not lay points. And... So I'm just going to go through with you really what go through the normal anatomy physiology of the heart just go through understanding how what happens with our heart when it's normal so that we can then for understand what happens with atrial fibrillation and why it's so important within primary care so a quick review of the anatomy of the heart i don't know about you i'm an ex-cardiac nurse an ex-cardiothoracic intensive care nurse i still can't label this diagram never had to <laughs> but i need to know what, how it works where it goes and what you know what it's doing and whether it's working properly. So I can assure you, even us that have worked in cardiac for years and years and years, can't even label this diagram, so don't worry about it. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the cardiac cycle. So you all know that diastole is the filling pressures and the systole is the pumping pressures. And at the beginning of a cardiac cycle then, where the, the atrium and the ventricle, ventricles are relaxed. Um, nothing's happening. This is the at-rest phase. At the beginning of a, a, a cardiac contraction, we've got a sinoatrial node up here, saying hello, and this will send off an, uh, a, a, an impulse that will spread across the atria and cause it to contract. Now with that contraction, it's going to push all the blood that's in, in the, the atria into the ventricle. Um, you're going to find that the... the I've, I've totally skipped myself, I'm really nervous, sorry. <laughs> So your atrium ventricle relax. Your right atrium is going to fill with blood passively from the pressure that's left in the system from the previous um, contraction. Um, this is going to cause your tricuspid valve to open and in, um, cause an impulse from the sinoatrial node, which then contracts that atrium um, to empty itself into the ventricle. Once the ventricle is uh, fully expanded and you've got that, um, that nice stretch, it's going to, the, the electrical impulse that's held in the atrioventricular node is held, uh, will then contract down the septum and round the outside. Now, the reason that the atrium and ventricle don't contract at the same time uh, is, is to stop the atrium and ventricle from contracting at the same time because obviously then the blood wouldn't be going anywhere. Uh, and then vice versa, it's exactly the same through. Um, on the right side as well, I'm going to skip that because I'm pretty sure you're all perfectly capable of understanding how a heart beats. So what's the difference in atrial fibrillation? Well, in atrial fibrillation, instead of the, uh, instead of the impulse being sent from the sinoatrial node, which is then spread nice and gently and, co and um, coordinatedly across the atria, which causes that nice, smooth contraction which fully empties the atria into the ventricles, what you've got is you've got overstimulation within those cells within the atria. So every, every cell within the, the heart is perfectly capable of being a pacemaker within its own right. And each cell has that um, energy and ability to cause its own contraction. Now, for various reasons, there are extra firing off, going off within, uh, all across the atria. It could just be one pathway. It could be lots of cells all at the same time. And this causes the atria to attempt to try and contract, but all uncoordinated. So it's all a mess. So you, 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 the atria at the top are quivering so they're not contracting, they're not pushing blood through effectively. Um, so how is this affecting our ability to um, create a good blood pressure? Um, the other thing to note is the AV node is waiting for a signal from its SA node. So your sinoatrial node at the top, AV node at the bottom. Your normal impulse, sinoatrial node, contraction, AV node holds it, contraction of the ventricles. In AF, you've got all sorts of firing about. Your AV node waits for an impulse that's large enough to, to uh, stimulate the, itself to cause its contraction. So it's sort of sat waiting, looking up, going, well, that's a bit of a mess, isn't it? Uh, oh, that one felt big enough. All right, I'll contract now. No, no. Okay, that one, yep, I'm going to contract. So you get an irregular heart rate, which is what we all know is, is atrial fibrillation, and we're all quite used to feeling for that pulse and knowing what it is. But what does that mean for our patients? So atrial fibrillation itself is not life-threatening on its own. It has some potentially dangerous effects, though. So it increases um, the chance of um, sorry, it increases the chance of forming blood clots. So really weird analogy here, but do any of you go walking in the woods? 
past um, lots of nice little streams and as you're watching your water go down the streams it's all quite nice and flowing you can see the, the water moving quickly and flowing nicely when you get to some rocks that are in the way and you'll find and that similarly to what the valve would look like in the heart and the blood itself starts pooling around these rocks it causes what we call if you like physics which I do because I'm a geek causes eddy currents and this water or eddy currents like it would be in the blood will pull together and it moves less and as it moves less it starts to stick together as it sticks together it causes clots we don't like clots we all know what clots can cause they cause myocardial infarctions they cause stroke you've got a five-fold increase in the chance of causing a stroke in these patients if they've got unmanaged atrial fibrillation atrial fibrillation also causes reduced cardiac output so without the um <laughs> without that um, coordinated contraction from the atri uh, atria into the ventricles you're losing what's known as the atrial kick so the ventricle itself will fill up passively from the previous um, heart contraction but the last bit of blood that's put in to cause that nice stretch in the ventricular muscle which is what causes the excellent recoil which is required for a good heartbeat is missing so your atrial kick is um, responsible for about 20 to 30 percent of cardiac output so losing that can make a massive difference to somebody if they've already got a low blood pressure. Um, compounded to that, there's less time, because it's usually a tachycardia event, because there's less time between heartbeats. There's less time for oxygen to be pushed back down into the, carotid, the coronary arteries in order to get oxygen to the muscle that we're asking to contract constantly 60 times a minute, every minute for the rest of our lives. Uh, and we all know that oxygen is very important in muscle contraction and it's also um, it, it also gives less time for the ventricle itself to fill I'm not going to harp on about Stalin's law because I'll lose you all and it's really dull but essentially if you think about an elastic band if you hold an elastic band and don't stretch it very far and let go it just drops on the floor and doesn't go anywhere if you stretch an elastic band um, with good you know, give it a good stretch and let go it's going to fire really really far but equally when you get to heart failure if you overstretch it'll snap so there's you've got to find that hack medium and that's what Stalin's law is but essentially if we're losing our atrial kick as we do in atrial fibrillation then we're losing that extra elastic elasticity in the heart that's going to lead to some damage being caused by low blood pressure so what are the main risk factors for atrial fibrillation so i'm sure you already all know these but for those of you that don't we're talking about lifestyle and as we've heard a lot today, it's all very, very similar lifestyle choices. Obesity, alcohol consumption, decreased activity levels, and then obviously your normal risk factors for uh, car cardiovascular disease. So you've got your smoking, your stress, your caffeine, and your stimulants. Um, you've got other, other con uh, conditions, are your hypertension, your heart failure, because um, these can affect the um, functionality of the heart, which can then lead to the irregular heart rhythms. Coronary heart disease, again, damage to the heart. Previous surgery, OSA, which is obstructive sleep apnea, for those of you that don't like the three-word, um, <laughs> three-letter um, things, and diabetes. And then the non-modifiable, these are things we can't do anything about. So the older they get, usually plus 65 has got a much higher increase in atrial fibrillation. Congenital heart defects, a family history of AF and other, con and other heart problems. Genetics and being a male actually increases your chance of AF quite highly as well. So the reason that I'm talking to you about AF today, because you're probably all sort of thinking, why? <laughs> so in, back in April, they've updated the um, NICE guidance. Um, and it, it, it's just, so it's just a quick sort of check in with you all and make sure that you're aware of the, the updates. So obviously we're still looking at performing a manual pulse check, which obviously as practice nurses, which I know the majority of you are, but also in other roles that you are here for as well is you're going to come across patients from many different guises and one of the things we all do when we see our patients is we'll, we'll, we'll do a blood pressure check or a pulse check so we're in a perfect place to be able to pick up atrial fibrillation just um, incidentally but equally if we know they've got all those risk factors we're going to be looking for it anyhow um, also if you've got any patient with symptoms of breathlessness palpitations syncope um, dizziness chest discomfort previous strokes tias all those things that, that we're going to be looking for AF anyway as a contributing factor to those disorders that may have been missed in the past. Um, the best way to diagnose is from a 12 lead ECG. 
um, and if, a, if an irregular rhythm is found, regardless of whether or not they've got symptoms, it's the most accurate diagnosis, but, it's because it's, um, but it cannot be relied upon because not everybody has persistent, regular AF. There are a lot of people with, if you've heard of it, paroxysmal AF, so if your irregular pulse is transient, which is suspected proximal AF, and it isn't picked up at that point in time with doing the 12 lead, you might look at doing a 24-hour tape or maybe a three-day um, heart reveal. Again, they're usually done at specialist cardiac centres, but it's nice if you know that they're there. So if you know they've got an irregular heart rate, but you do a 12 lead and it's regular, just to be aware that it might be worth referring them on. It's less accurate, as it only, it's only done through the one lead, but at least you can then pick up if there is that irregular heart rhythm and the cardiologists and the hospitals can go on to look at it further. Well, the considerations for your atrial fibrillation, according to the new guidelines, that we should be looking at using the CHA2DS2 vascular stroke risk. It's a mouthful. I get you're all going to remember that, aren't you? Fortunately, it's all on the NICE guidelines, so you don't need to. Um, but when you get my slides, the title for the picture underneath will take you straight to this risk assessment, so you can find it really easily. It's really, really simple. All you need to do is put in the, the general age of the patient, uh, what sex they are, and then uh, cardiovascular history, hypertension history, previous stroke vascular disease and diabetes history, and that will give you a, a score for your patient. And then there's information on that um, risk assessment that tells you what to do next, which is fab saves you having to think too much. But equally, always use clinical guidance as well. Um, but if you've got a, you're looking for a score of two or more really for your atrial, atrial fibrillation. Any symptomatic or asymptomatic paroxysmal AF, atrial flutter or any continuing risk of arrhythmia recurrence. So this is if you've had a cardioversion, they're still at risk of going back into AF. Any, any attempt at cardioversion for atrial fibrillation, there's a really, really high risk of them going back into a, a, an arrhythmia in the future. Um, it's not, there's not a very high, um, it's not a very high uh, uh, permanence to the cardioversions for AF, unfortunately. Other considerations would be how we would treat our atrial fibrillation due to bleeding risk. So we all know, historically, atrial fibrillation is treated with warfarin generally speaking. Um, so we're all used to anticoagulation and AF going hand in hand, but obviously we need to risk assess those patients to see if they're at risk of, of excessive bleeding. So we'd use the orbit bleeding risk score. Again, um, on my slides when you get them, uh, there's a link straight through to the, the risk score itself. And again, it's quite self-explanatory. Oh. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a question. Um, and again, you're looking at sex, age, bleeding history, EGFR and treatment with antiplatelet agents, because obviously there's interactions with those. Um, you would consider starting anticoagulation with people that are in atrial fibrillation, but you'd also re-risk assess regularly with your patients to review whether they still need to take it or whether they need to change what, what they're on. You're going to offer monitoring and support to... to to modify those risk factors for bleeding. So we're looking at uncontrolled hypertension, poor control of INR, concurrent medications, other antiplatelets. There's a whole host of interactive drugs with, with issues with around bleeding. So it's really important that even though you do the risk score, you need to be looking at polypharmacy and everything else that's going on and making sure you're making the correct choices for those patients. Now, other considerations for atrial fibrillation as well then are your referrals to your secondary care. So you can only do so much within your primary care. So you can um, acknowledge its existence, maybe start some treatments, but it might be that you want to send your patient in for a transthoracic echo. Uh, so if you've got, if you need a, a baseline echo anyway for input, for management of long-term conditions, or if you think you're going to be looking at cardioversion or there's a sp suspicion of functional or structural damage to the heart, um, then you would send them for a, 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 a transthoracic echo. And then from that, the cardiologist or yourself might want to send for a TOE, which is a transesophageal echocardiogram. They're not nice, but they do give much better pictures and a much better idea of what's going on functionally in the heart. So these are really good for patients who've had a difficult TTE with poor quality, or if they're going to do a TOE-guided cardioversion, which is a very specialist um, treatment that happens within the hospital. Um, so things that you should be offering within primary care to, pe to be patients that are newly diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. You want to be offering a personalised care package that's well documented in your notes, including your stroke awareness and measures to prevent stroke, rate how, uh, understanding your rate control, who to contact for advice if needed, 
psychological support if needed, and really importantly, um, up to date and comprehensive education information, but really importantly, who to go to for that support outside of primary care, so a place like British Heart Foundation, for example. Um, letting them understand the cause and effect and possible complications of AF. So it's really important that our patients understand what they're at risk of and how they might be able to modify some of their lifestyle and behaviours to help with their management of atrial fibrillation. Um, and the, the, the practical advice and anticoagulation, so depending on which anticoagulation you're going to be um, treating them with, you know, th those risks and complications as well. This is a really busy slide. I'm not expecting you to read it all, but it's essentially the guidance from, from NICE that's just been updated is we're to try and offer anticoagulation. So have you heard of your DOAX, so your uh, Rivoxabans and your uh, Apixabans and Dabigatrans and Edoxabans, etc., etc. These are your new um, direct-acting oral anticoagulants that are coming out now, and there is a, 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 a leaning towards preferring these instead of your um, vitamin K antagonists, such as your warfarins, because they don't require the constant uh, regular management of INRs. Um, there's a lot less risk with bleeding, um, and there's uh, less side effects, and equally, um, you've got reversal agents for your DOAX, which you don't have for warfarin. Um, so there is a, a lean towards using these, and there is, evident, there is um, guidance within nice that we should be looking at trying to move all patients on to DOAX where possible but if your patients are comfortable settled on warfarin they're getting regularly um they're getting regularly reviewed by the anticoagulation clinic so that it, sometimes that can help if you've got a patient that you know that's not particularly um good at maintaining um relationships with the with the the, the gp practice then being on warfarin can actually be quite good because it just gives you that that step in to keep an eye on them as well but obviously it's 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 got comes with its own risks bleeding and things that so yeah, keep an eye on that um so you just make sure you're considering the anticoagulation with the doac so you men with atrial fibrillation are at higher risk so trying to get those onto your uh, anticoagulation a bit quicker um if the doacs are contraindicated then there would be a a, um, a push for try and warfarin type medications and those are already taking vitamin K um, to continue with their current medication, but continue with those risk assessments to see if they might be better on the DOAC. Um, we, we're not currently pushing for um, offering anticoagulation with those patients under 65 with no other, no other risk factors other than their age. If there's no other signs and symptoms that there might be any problems, then um, they, they can usually manage without and not to withhold anticoagulation because of their age or risk of falls because they're still quite important to make sure they're anticoagulated but just needs to be closely managed so that they're not having any issues. Um, rate and rhythm control then. So we normally offer first line, uh, rate control as the first line treatment for um, atrial fibrillation. It's usually done by beta blocker or rate limiting calcium channel blocker such as bisoprolol, ramipril. Um, and then you would you would also look at considering digoxin monotherapy for those with non-paroxymal AF. If that doesn't control it, then you would be looking at um, combination therapies. There's, um, personally for me, my background is a good fortune acute care, so I'm very much on the amiodarone train. But it's not this isn't it's not the uh, the, the, the the guidance given for in primary care. Amiodarone is a nasty, dirty drug that comes with lots of horrible side effects and. Us horrible nurses in secondary care just seem to start it and then it's not always good to continue it. So if you do find someone on amiodarone, it's good to do a, do a review and, and see if we can get them on something a bit nicer, a bit better. Um, and then you've got rhythm control and antirhythmic. So there's always an assessment for need for, for long-term rhythm control. A lot of patients are actually <coughs> asymptomatic with their AF and with that you possibly wouldn't be too focused on ryth um, rhythm control if their blood pressures are being maintained and they're not... Um, decompensating um, you'd follow there's a new drug out done from Denner I can't even say it <laughs> drones around as a second line treatment for long term control after a successful cardioversion so there are getting more and more drugs out there that are trying to maintain the therapy after cardioversion um, so they are, it is getting a lot better but it's, it's, it's still not perfect um, and then people with infrequent um, symptomatic AF there's a push to move towards no, no drug strategy or pill in the pocket strategy. So this is these people that are 
um, capable of understanding um, understanding how and when to take the medications. Their blood pressure is um, normally over 100, 100 systolic and heart rates over 70. They're infrequent symptomatic episodes and no history of um, cardiovascular dysfunction or any valvular issues. You would be quite happy to give them their own antiarrhythmic they can take as and when they have. Or if they know, they, if they know that they've got a trigger for their AF. So if they go, oh, I get, I get palpitations when I have a lot of coffee they might be someone that you would give the pill in the pocket to. So if they know they're going out and they're going to have a nice coffee morning with their friends, then they can pop one of those uh, medications to keep their palpitations under control when they're having coffee, but they wouldn't need it regularly because they don't go out every, every day for a coffee, if that makes sense. <clears throat> so the treatment and management of atrial fibrillation, you need to refer to a specialist cardiologist for more invasive treatment. So if you've got a patient that's been complaining of um, palpitations, <clears throat> That are affecting their day-to-day -day life or the symptoms have been uh, um, c consistently there for over 48 hours you'd um, you would you would refer to a specialist cardiologist if they've been having those symptoms for less than 24 hours so these are usually the ones that refer themselves because they've got palpitations and they're feeling breathless and they take themselves into um a and e but you might find they come to you and they go i've got terrible chest pain my, my heart's fluttering you would probably just send them i would hope straight to to accident emergency anyway, and they would have something a pharmacology, a pharmacological cardioversion with either flecainide or amiodarone, which obviously uh, can only happen in the hospital because it needs to be under monitoring, or, or a direct uh, DC cardioversion if longer than 24 hours, when you've had time to 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 anticoagulate them. Um, other options are left atrial ablation, which um, just for your own knowledge, if you you've got a patient that's going for one, it's a catheter inserted into the, the, the femoral artery that goes up into the heart and they use heat or cold to create scars in the atria to break those electrical pathways. It's not 100% more often than not the heart finds another way to bypass that and creates another pathway but it can give them some, some relief for a, for a short period of time. Um, usually what happens is they do pacing and ablation therapy so they might go into the heart and they'll ablate the atrioventricular node which as we were talking about earlier is what is is in the middle and is is in control of the ventricular contractions and if that's if you if you ablate that which means stop it from working and cause it to scar so it can't do its job would mean that the ventricles wouldn't be able to contract on their own so you would then put a pacemaker in but removing that av node means that the all uh, over excitation happening in the atria wouldn't then correspond down uh, wouldn't then um transport translate down into the ventricles and cause that contractions therefore you'd remove that tachycardia which then uh, can cause the other cardiovascular issues such as um, chest pain because they're not getting enough oxygen to the muscle and, 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 and shortness of breath. Um, the, the only other thing that came up while we were while I was looking through for you in the, in the new NICE guide is, is there's a lot of um, there's a, a big push to, to ensure that you understand that people with a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation that we shouldn't just stop our anticoagulation once we've had no sign of it of um, the irreg irregular rhythm because as we've discussed before atrial fibrillation can be paroxysmal and transient and just because you can't find it at that point when you're reviewing it, it wouldn't be you wouldn't immediately stop those anticoagulants you might think about um, doing a 24-hour tape or a three-day tape just to see if those uh, the symptoms have settled completely before you would still base that decision on a, another reassessment of the bleeding risk in the orbit and then obviously discuss with the patient what their preferences are. Some patients don't like to be taking off medication. Um, so it, we obviously we always include our patients and their choices. Um, so why is primary care best place to diagnose and treat atrial fibrillation? Well, obviously you're seeing these patients on a, uh, a reg semi-regular basis. Um, one of the things we all did before COVID was reach out and feel our patients, take a pulse, do a manual blood pressure. Um, and in doing that, you're gonna come across whether or not that's uh, irregular. Um, it, it is the most common cardiac arrhythmia and it's, it's not generally life-threatening but if we can treat it we can prevent further complications and with the introduction of the new DOAC medications we can we can at primary care level now manage that much easier because we're not relying on coagulation clinic specialist hematologists um, it's something that we can do ourselves so it, it, you know we're obviously saving a lot of money we're reducing risks of uh, um, poor poor therapeutic range. Um, so yeah, in conclusion then, it's just useful to be aware of all the risk factors that predispose our patients to atrial fibrillation. It's important to be aware of how it can affect the body and what complications to look out for. 
The assessment and management of AF is really important and we're in the best position to be doing that. Um, there is a move away from vitamin K antagonists towards the DOAX, but again, it should be done on a patient-by-patient -patient basis and it should be a clinical decision, not a, oh, well, it's easier. It, 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 you, know, you know what you're doing <laughs> long enough. And um, there are so many rate and rhythm medications to be used out there if patients are symptomatic. So if one um, level of one, one um, treatment doesn't work, there's always others that you can try that might work better for those patients. And there's always further treatment options within secondary care that we can access via referrals from the specialist cardiologist. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. <coughs> Are, are there any questions? I know I've kind of rushed through it really quickly because I was aware that we we're running over time, so I didn't want to harbour on any points. But um, if there's any questions, if anyone wants to go through exactly anything about AF itself, um, just ask. I'll... I did rush through that part quite quickly. <laughs>